Good evening and welcome to our virtual tasting, New York Wines from Corner to Corner, hosted by sommelier Yannick Benjamin. My name is Sam Filler and I'm the executive director of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. We are the organization that is representing the talented and hardworking winemakers and grape growers across New York State. And we have the privilege of bringing you this evening's event. Um, for those of you that are familiar with our New York Drinks New York program, uh, you may be familiar with our uh, annual New York Drinks New York Grand Tasting that we hold every March. And we were excited to be partnered with the Rainbow Room and their beautiful space. And uh, as we all know, COVID happened somewhere in mid-March and we uh, unfortunately had to cancel and reshuffle our plans. And here we are tonight uh, bringing you uh, the last seminar from, from that series. Um, so, you know, much has happened over the past six months and I think uh, we've become very comfortable with Zoom and enjoying a great glass of wine in front of a Zoom meeting or Zoom uh, get together with our family and nothing pairs better with that than I think a glass of New York State wine. So uh, while this format is a little bit different than we intended, you know, getting together and doing this in person, we're honored to have Yannick Benjamin here tonight as our virtual host. And he's going to introduce us to the minds behind the wines. We have a great lineup for you tonight. So he'll lead us through a tasting of some of the delicious examples of the New York wines from corner to corner. Um, so thanks to all of you for uh, being here for this exciting session. And this uh, in particular couldn't happen without our uh, sponsors at American National Insurance and Cadu Cooperage. These companies are dedicated to providing quality services to grape growers and winemakers across New York. And we're proud to have them as our colleagues and friends and we thank them for their support. So just a bit of housekeeping before we uh, get started. And also while you remain on mute for the uh, beginning of this, um, but good news is that we do wanna have some engagement with you. And an important thing to note is that uh, there is a Q and A feature that should be at the bottom of your screen, which shouldn't be confused with the chat feature. The Q and A feature allows you to ask questions to all our panelists which you can do anonymously if you choose, but it gives a chance for everyone to see your question. And uh, we, as appropriate during the discussion, we can open the floor for you um, for an interactive follow-up with Yannick and our, and our panelists. So um, to familiarize yourself with tonight's wines, we have also prepared a tasting map, text sheets, and a map of our regions. And so if you look in the chat feature, there should be a link that will help you uh, get access to those. And we encourage you to review those or if it's a little too much for right now, after the tasting, please take the time to, to look through those as they'll give you some more in-depth information about the wines we'll be drinking tonight. So before we uh, introduce you to Yannick and our panelists, we want to take a moment to see, uh, do a little poll and see what everyone's experience with New York wines have been and what regions you've been to. So uh, on your screen now should be a poll. So please fill that out. And the first one to finish gets to take a sip out of their glass first. All right, just a couple more seconds and we'll wrap up. So I don't, Amy, if you uh, are able to see, the, oh, here we go, all right. 87% of those on tonight have visited a New York winery in the past year. That's great. And uh, majority have been to the Finger Lakes, Hudson Valley, uh, a little, little more to Long Island and some to Niagara Escarpment. So, uh, well, congratulations tonight. You'll learn even more about Long Island and Niagara and probably you'll hear from some familiar faces from the Finger Lakes tonight as well and the Hudson Valley. Um, so to keep us moving, um, just to give you some more background about all our regions, you know, compared to uh, Europe's wine regions, you know, literally New York wine country is huge from the corner of Long Island all the way out to uh, Western New York and that Lake Erie region you see on the map and to the top there in the Champlain Valley on the border with Canada. We have over 470 wineries, 11 American viticulture areas or AVAs, and they all have their own unique climate, scenery, character, and wine varieties. 
And today we're sampling from four different ABAs, and these are really the, the main uh, heavy hitters of our state, and those are Long Island, the Hudson Valley, the Finger Lakes, and the Niagara Escarpment. And so um, Long Island is probably the closest, if not, it's a little bit of a tie with Hudson Valley, but it's, it's about two hours from New York City. It's home to 70 wineries, with about 2,000 acres under vine, and it is a laid back maritime haven blessed with sunshine, sea, delicious oysters, long growing season. And, and Long Island is really best known for its superb reds, classic Bordeaux blends, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And then if we travel in North, we'll hit the Hudson River region. This is home to 50 wineries, 230 acres of vineyards. It's midway between New York City and Albany. And it features densely forested hills dotted with elegant mansions overlooking the majestic Hudson River. I went to Vassar College, so I personally really love this region myself. Wineries here produce superb wines using Native American, French American, and European grape varieties, which are ideally su suited for the region's unique climate and soil. Then as we move further west, we hit the Finger Lakes region with its thin parallel lakes flanked by steep hillsides. This, is, this region boasts almost 150 wineries with over 9,300 acres of vineyards. Wineries here specialize in Riesling, sparkling wine, Cabernet Franc, and ice wine, and many are also known for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And then flanking Buffalo, you'll find over 20 wineries in the Niagara Escarpment with over 880 acres of vines. It's got a unique climate, and it's one of the warmest AVAs in New York State due to its proximity to the Great Lakes, and also because of the Escarpment itself. It, the escarpment traps the warm air currents from Lake, Lake Ontario, and it's got a unique soil with the dolomite limestone soil of the escarpment. So gravel silt sits near the lakeshore along with a moderate climate, which are ideal for growing grapes in a wide variety of fruit. And I know uh, Robin Ross has got an exciting presentation for you all about Niagara Escarpment. So, so you can see there's a world of wine here to discover. Thankfully, this is just the beginning of the journey. And we hope this is the first in a long line of virtual seminars that you'll participate in with us. And these are really designed to introduce you to the creative, diverse, and ever-evolving world of wine that you can find right here in New York State. So I know you're excited to meet Yannick and our winery panelists here tonight. Uh, so with that, just a quick introduction. Yannick is the head of the sommelier. He, he's the head sommelier at the University Club, and he's the proprietor of Contento Restaurant located in NYC. And personally, I'm excited to Go to Contento when it opens because it reminds me of my tia abuela in Argentina who would always ask me at the end of a good meal, sas contento? So hopefully you can also find joy in his restaurant as well. He is a proud New Yorker. He's born into a family of French restaurateurs who knew that hospitality was his calling from a young age. He's also worked at Le Cirque, Oceana, Jean Georges, and Atlas before becoming a sommelier at the Lydia and Atelier at the Ritz Carlton. In 2003, a car accident left him paralyzed below the waist. However, he quickly adapted. He outfitted his wheelchair with a table that allows him to work the floor as a sommelier. And as a result, he's been recognized as wine enthusiast top 40 under 40 and was named person of the year by New Mobility Magazine in 2017. Yannick also created Wine on Wheels. And it's one of New York City's largest and most exciting wine events, which has also been expanded to other cities in Chicago, Portland, and Washington, DC. Wine and Wheels is a great organization. It brings together hundreds of esteemed sommeliers who volunteer to pour over 250 wines from around the world for charity. Yannick is a para-athlete and competes in marathons to raise money for Wheeling Forward. Yannick, thank you so much for being here. We're looking wow. forward to having you introduce us to the wines and the minds behind the wines today. So I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Sam, for the introduction. And um, everything that Sam has said, I completely agree. I mean, when we talk about the state of New York, it is so vast, it's so broad um, to just say that, oh, what's happening in Long Island applies to what's happening in the Hudson Valley and what's happening in the Hudson Valley applies to the Finger Lakes. Um, I would completely disagree with you. Um, you know, from just where I'm at in New York City, it takes me probably about 90 minutes to get at the very kind of beginning of the river of, of uh, the North Fork and probably another 90 minutes to get into the heart of wine country in the Hudson Valley and probably a good four and a half to five hours to the Finger Lake. So that just kind of gives you an idea. Um, geologically, a lot of these ABAs are completely different and climatically. And then also you take on personality and a certain culture which, with um, each of these regions. Um, they're focused on certain grape varietals and how they, 
they, they grow their grapes and how they make their wines is certainly uh, hugely important. Um, I am excited at the path, I mean, at the path that New York is going towards right now. Um, certainly we've seen, or we're seeing right now what's happening in California. It's absolutely terrible and our thoughts are with them. I think New York is at a great advantage right now as far as climat climatically. And we have one of the best water sources in the wor world and the minerality that it offers to wines for complexity and depth is unbelievable. I'm really proud to be able to say when I'm featuring wines from New York to my guests, um, I'm born and raised here and I think it's just normal as a New Yorker, as someone that's in the hospitality industry, that I have a responsibility to represent these wines. I mean, it's part of sustainability. My biggest issue when I go to a restaurant in New York City is when I hear themselves call, call themselves sustainable and you don't find one wine from New York or anywhere within the Northeast region. And that to me is a bit problematic, but I do think that there's always a sil silver lining when there are issues like this uh, COVID um, virus that we're currently dealing with. I do think that people are going to step back and realize how important it is to support what we have in our own very backyard and the immense quality and diversity that we have. So to start off with things, I wanna introduce Megan Frank from Dr. Constantine Frank. She's representing the region of Puka Lake or the Finger Lakes. And I've had the good fortune to spend time at her winery. Um, historically important, not to just the New York State winery, but the American viticultural, uh, viticultural um, history. Um, her father, Dr. Constantine Frank, really was, you know, avant-garde in terms of um, terms of thinking of just being ahead of the game and saying, "Hey, we can actually grow vinifera grapes," and we will be featuring her 2014 Blanc de Blanc. Um, these are wines that can age um, really. I mean, I've had some older um, sparkling wines from their this house, and they're absolutely stunning. But they just don't do sparkling wines; they do some tremendous whites. Wonderful reds and, a, and some sweet wines too. But I'm going to let Megan Frank talk about the winery itself, a little bit of the, the historical background, talk a little bit about Chuka Frank, and then finally go into a little bit about the uh, 2014 Block the Block. So welcome, Megan. Thank you so much, Yannick. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you tonight. I'm really excited to, to share some wine with everybody. Uh, so, as Yannick mentioned, uh, we're located on the west side of Cuca Lake, which is also the view behind me. Uh, and it's just kind of starting to set, the sun is starting to set, so it's about what it looks like in my background. So I wanted to introduce you to kind of the region, and you're also going to hear from John Wagner um, from Wagner Vineyards, an exceptional winery as well, uh, who will also talk about the region. But we are located um, about five hours from New York City, northwest, so you can see that red portion. Um, and we have these incredibly deep glacial lakes. And that is really the key to our region. So legend has it that the Great Spirit put his, ha put his hands uh, on the land to bless the earth. And when he took his hands off, uh, left behind these really deep lakes. Um, geologists would disagree. Uh, they say that during the last ice age, about 10,000 years ago, um, these ice um, blocks melted and created these really deep uh, lakes. And when we're talking deep, we're talking really deep. You know, Seneca Lake is over 600 feet deep, that middle finger lake there. Uh, Cuca Lake, uh, its neighbor, is about 187 feet deep. Uh, Cuyuca Lake is over 400 feet deep, so incredibly deep lakes. And what these lakes do is they moderate our climate. So they hold in heat, and so they're able to warm the area during our very cold winters. And let's not forget, we have Lake Ontario, very, uh, very close, stones throw away. And uh, you can see that from the corner, uh, the right-hand map there, over 800 feet deep. So we have all of these moderating influences and it really creates um, a really beautiful place to be, but also a really great place to grow grapes and make wine. So you can see kind of the lake effect here. Uh, this is a photo that was taken in March of 2018. And you can see that the lakes have not frozen. So they're still blue. Uh, lake Ontario really helping that kind of moderating effect. And um, these, the deepest lakes never ever freeze. And that's really important for the very cold winters. And they're just retaining that heat. And then in the summertime, 
uh, when it's quite warm outside, the lakes are cooling the area. So uh, kind of this dual effect makes it a really great place uh, for us. So very, very nice moderating effect. Uh, on the right hand side, this is actually a photo I just took uh, three days ago. This is our Pinot Noir vineyard. Uh, this is a technique called hilling up which is a way to mitigate our uh, risk for winter damage. So basically a plow goes through and just hills up about a foot of soil to protect the graft union, which is the most vulnerable portion of the vine. And this is something my great grandfather, Constantine, actually pioneered into the region. It's something he practiced in his birthplace of Ukraine except to a much greater degree because they would actually bury the entire vine. Uh, it was so incredibly cold there. So just healing up that, that uh, foot of soil, that's something that um, warmer regions, you know, out west in California, Washington, Oregon, don't have to do, um, but it is an important part of viticulture for us here in the, in the region. So winter damage is definitely our Achilles heel. Um, now taking it to some of our estate vineyards here. Um, so we are on the western side of Cuca Lake. And uh, there's many differences. You know, I think there's so many interesting um, vineyard sites throughout the Finger Lakes. It's an enormously large area um, with, you know, the, the powerhouse lakes being Cuca, Seneca, and Cayuga in terms of wineries. But Cuca Lake was our home base. So that's where my great grandfather started. And he planted um, uh, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Riesling, all in 1958 and then began kind of an experiment station of over 60 different varieties there. So we have a, an enormous diversity on that farm. Uh, what kind of is interesting about Cuca is the really steep slopes. So we're talking eight to 25% slopes, which is incredibly steep. And what happens with the steep slopes is the cold air is denser than warm air. So it kind of falls down and then it's able to drain down the hill. And then so you're meeting this very warm lake. So the air warms and then circulates back up. So it's this really interesting effect uh, that occurs, especially in the winter when we need that warming effect. Uh, so we're talking high elevation, you know, steep slopes, majority is a uh, shale and also some sandstone for the soil. So very rocky acidic soils, you know, producing really nice freshness to the wine. And then over on Seneca Lake, um, actually quite close to uh, our neighbors, John, uh, John Wagner, I'm sure we'll talk about his site as well, um, but known as the banana belt of the Finger Lakes. No bananas, but uh, quite warm. It's one of the warmest areas of the, of the whole Finger Lakes region. And um, my father started planting there in 2007. So Seneca Lake, you know, we're talking over 600 feet deep. So even more of that moderating effect. So we can plant more tender varieties like Gruner Veltliner, Pinot Gris, uh, Blau Frankish, a grape from Austria. So really um, a great asset for us to have. So talk, that's a, a nice photo of our shale on Cuca Lake. So really large chunks of, of shale. Uh, so I kind of mentioned uh, my, my great grandfather started the winery. He's the, the photo at the top left there with the barrel looking very proud. And uh, he was actually the first to successfully plant uh, the European grape varieties in the Eastern United States. So he had a background in viticulture from Ukraine and was a researcher there, um, was a refugee in World War II, ended up coming to New York landed in the Finger Lakes and sort of the rest is history for us. So he started um, our winery in 1962. Uh, next to him, also looking very proud, <laughs> is my grandfather, Willie, and he was the one to pioneer our sparkling wines. So we're celebrating our 35th anniversary of producing sparkling wines, all in the Meta Champenois, so traditional method, same method as if we were in Champagne. Uh, so that's a, a wine that we're going to try tonight, 2014 Blanc de Blanc. Uh, and then below we have my father Fred, who uh, took over the winery management in 1993 and has really increased both production and, and also quality. So it's a, it's a joy and an honor to, to work with him. Uh, so I put together this slide because we're, you know, going through harvest and there's lots going on and it's really fun to kind of see the progression of the vine um, and with our sparkling is our sparkling harvest is all over actually. So, you know, you can start with bud burst starting in May. Uh, this is on our Cuca estate 
We then have flowering starting in June, the end of June, you know, the start of the cluster formation. Fruit set in July, veraison, the change of color in August, and then finally harvest September 10th. You can see those beautiful clusters hand harvested. And then we're still going through fermentation. It should be just another few days. Um, but that's kind of the nice cycle, life cycle, if you will. Uh, typically in March, we bottle our sparkling wines. You can see that thick glass. So um, we have a still wine that we bottle. We put in a bit of yeast, a bit of sugar. That ignites a secondary fermentation. And um, carbon dioxide is a byproduct of fermentation. So that redissolves into the wine. And you can see these, uh, this kind of floating lava lamp in this photo. And those are the dead yeast cells or the leaves. So we age our sparkling wines for many years, um, between two to six years, depending on which wine it is. Uh, the Blanc Blanc had four years uh, lees aging. So um, basically that process is breaking down those lees and creating kind of the toast, brioche, um, really beautiful aromas and flavors. So hopefully we'll taste some of that with the sparkling. Uh, and this is kind of the rest of the process. So we, you know, age for a number of years in our, in our deep stone cellar. We riddle to get the yeast sediment out of the, or excuse me, down to the neck of the bottle. It takes about two weeks on the A-frame riddling racks. We then freeze the yeast plug with the, with the help of this machine with a glycol solution that freezes down to negative 22 degrees. Um, we disgorge the yeast plug out, very important, uh, top with some of the same wine and also the dosage, which is the reserve wine. And then we cork, we wire hood, we wash, we label, and, um, and that's basically the process. So I'd love to take you through um, the Blanc de Blanc if anyone has it. I certainly have a glass. Uh, Wednesday night, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, 2014 Blanc de Blanc is 100% Chardonnay. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and basically it's our most elegant sparkling that we produce. So we're talking four years aging on the leaves. And 2014 was the year the grapes were harvested. So it was just recently disgorged and every bottle on the back has a sticker that's put on by hand that, that lists the disgorgement month and year. So it's a really important thing to, to note, um, but very dry, very citric, and uh, definitely on the nose, get some of that kind of toast. Really high acidity, very fresh, very elegant. And if you hold up the glass, you can see the tiny bead of the, of the sparkling wine. And that's a really important part of this traditional method sparkling. So the most labor intensive method. Um, and I think the, the proof is in the pudding. It's definitely worth all the labor and all the hard work. So I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, Megan, before I let you go, um, what specific food pairings would you recommend with, uh, with the sparkling wine? Because it is quite complex. It's got some age. It's got some richness to it. Um, anything sure. in particular? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially with the Chardonnay base, you could do like um, a really beautiful like fish fry. You could do oysters. Even something as simple as potato chips, I think would work really well just because it has that acidity and it's very fresh and, you know, Wednesday night potato chips and Blanc de Blanc sounds like a good night to me. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for that question. Well, uh, thank you so much. I mean, you know, your, your winery and everyone that works there is just so wonderful. And it, they really do represent what the state of New York is when it comes to farmers, generosity, humility. And again, this incredible diversity that the state of New York has to offer is just uh, bar none, one of the best. And we're really blessed to have great people like you. So thank you, Megan. Thank you so much, Yannick. Thank you. Cheers. So, uh, <laughs> So we're uh, up next, we're, in, uh, we're going over to Seneca Lake to Wagner Vineyards. We're gonna be tasting the 2018 Kaywood East Riesling. We have John Wagner, a oh, fantastic winery. I had the pleasure to, to spend some time there as well. I love the uh, work that they do there. And John, perhaps you can talk a little bit about Seneca Lake, your terroir there, and a little bit about Wagner Vineyards. I'm super excited. Absolutely, thank you, Yannick. Um, I am John Wagner. I'm co-owner of Wagner Vineyards with my sister, Laura Wagner Lee. Um, we are located on the east side of Seneca Lake in Lodi, New York. And our, uh, our winery is focused on sustainability. Our winery is located right where the, the W logo is on the east side of Seneca Lake. 
So this is a similar photo to the one Megan showed, but this is drilled down uh, a little bit deeper. This is later in the winter, uh, 2015, and you can see other Finger Lakes frozen over, um, but Seneca Lake is, is wide open. And the, that is so important because of that moderating effect. Uh, we get a prevailing northwest wind coming across Seneca Lake. Um, our farm is located just adjacent to the deepest part of Seneca Lake. Um, 640 feet right in front of the farm. And it, that, that moderating effect is, is key to the fact that we're able to grow uh, vinifera grapes sustainably on that ground. Um, my family has, has grown grapes here on the east side of Seneca Lake for five generations. And it's, it's really given us an intimate respect for the land and for our farm. We are 100% estate bottled. Uh, that does set us apart a little bit from some of the wineries in the region. Um, we are farming 225 acres of grapes and we over the last 42 years have, uh, have got the, the largest planting of Riesling and the diversity on that clone uh, and variety as well. Um, I, wanna, I wanna back up just a little bit to my, my father was Bill Wagner. He was a lifelong grape grower for the Taylor Wine Company. Um, he had always seen winemaking on a very large scale, delivering his grapes to the Taylor Wine Company, as many growers in the region did. Um, in, in 1972, he took a trip with area grape growers to Europe, and he really saw winemaking on a small scale for the first time. Um, so at that time, we were growing a lot of French-American hybrids for the Taylor Wine Company, and he, he when he was over in Europe, he really saw, hey, I'm doing a lot of this hard work growing these high quality grapes, and I could do this. I could do this on this small scale. Before that, he had seen winemaking with, you know, 100,000 gallon tanks and very, uh, very costly equipment. So he came back. Uh, this photo that you're seeing now is in 1976, after the passage of the New York State Farm Winery Act. Uh, my father uh, is in the white t-shirt, my grandfather is there, and that's me, uh, standing on the foundation, the cellar wall of the winery, looking into what would become our, our wine cellar. So he came back and really hatched this plan. Um, coincidentally, New York State passed the Farm Winery Act in 76, so he, he dove in. Um, we were the first farm winery to begin construction on Seneca Lake. We were the second one to actually open because it, uh, the construction process took us three years. We were building the building with uh, our existing help and vineyard crew. Um, it, it is a unique octagonal building. It was my father's own design, um, kind of built around the, the, the round barn concept where a very efficient use of the center core for the winemaking um, and then the outer part is dedicated to hospitality and our tasting room. Uh, so it's uh, when we first began wine production, our first vintage was 1978. We were producing wines from the grapes that we had in the ground um, and were growing for the Taylor Wine Company. So those grapes were primarily, as I mentioned earlier, French American hybrids. In 1978, we, uh, my father planted our first Riesling. And we, we really began to, it's a steep learning curve as, as Megan knows with, with grafted vines, keeping them alive in this environment. We are very fortunate that our site is one of the warmer sites in the Finger Lakes with that proximity to Seneca Lake. Um, as, as we uh, got more experience in the winery and began to plant more vinifera, we added Gewurztraminer and Chardonnay uh, and then in the early 80s, we planted Pinot Noir, Cab Franc, Cab Sauv, and Merlot. Um, so for, for a number of years, we, we had pretty much equal acreages of all those different vinifera varieties. And uh, about 25 years ago, we really honed in on Riesling as, as a variety that we could do year in and year out. And we really, uh, no matter if it was a, a dry, hot year like, like it is this year in 2020, uh, wet, cool year, whatever the circumstances were, we really pulled off the varietal character of Riesling. And that's when we decided to really expand our acreage. So uh, we have almost a third of our 225 acres are, are dedicated to this single variety. Uh, we do produce six different wines out of Riesling. 
Tonight we're going to be tasting, as Yannick mentioned, our 2018 single vineyard Kaywood East, which is our driest Riesling. Um, so uh, the our Kaywood East site is is named for a small hamlet uh, in the town of Lodi called Kaywood. Um, it, it it doesn't have a post office or anything anymore, but it is right. Uh, it's about a quarter mile south of the winery. Um, we planted. Uh, 15 and a half acres of Riesling on this site in 2005. So this site has, uh, we've grown grapes on this site for over hundred years. Um, so in 2005, we removed all the existing vines that were on there. We pattern tiled the entire site. Um, so drain tile is, is really key to us as far as winter survivability of our vines. And what that does is, is uh, putting a perforated pipe down in the ground and we try to place that about four feet deep in the ground underneath the vineyard and that will allow us to lower the seasonal water table of that soil and grapevines don't like wet feet so if we can lower that seasonal water table down and drive the root system of the vines deeper into the soil uh, they're, they're very resistant to drought conditions like we had this year um, so we, we, we pattern tiled that entire vineyard. It has over six miles of underground piping in it. A, a huge investment, um, but we think it really helps with the sustainability of, of vinifera vines. Uh, and also the, the site is one of the steepest sites that we have for, for growing Riesling. We're right about uh, a thousand feet above sea level on this site um, and it is 15 years old. So um, in the first oh, decade or so of its life, uh, the, the fruit went into all of our classic dry, semi-dry, and our select Rieslings. And the winemaking team really began to identify it as being different fruit. Um, it's, the, the vineyard itself is on mostly uh, honey oil loam and, and Lansing silt loam, which are traditionally pretty deep soils uh, to begin with. Um, over 80 inches to any kind of uh, impediment for root, rooting. And then supplementing that with the, uh, with the drain tile, we really are able to establish uh, deep, deep root systems for these vines. Our entire uh, vinifera acreage, uh, which is a little over half of what we grow on our farm, is trained on the Scott Henry training system. Uh, we're very bullish on this, on this system. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, half the, the canopy is trained vertically upward and half the canopy is trained vertically downward. So it effectively doubles the, the area of canopy that we can display to the sun. It really opens up the fruit zone nicely um, and then that additional canopy really pushes ripeness for us. Um, and I think that's one of the, the hallmarks of the wines that we produce uh, at our winery is we really, they are all driven by ripe fruit. Uh, we have uh, definitely been growing towards uh, more extended hang time and really awesome fruit expression. Um, so the winemaking team really identified this, this block as being worthy of a single vineyard expression. Um, and we've, we've made it for about six years now. And it, it is our driest wine uh, for Riesling. And it's always the first blend that we make from the different clones that are in that block. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we will experience when you taste the wine is as some of the, some of the real super dry Rieslings in the region and in other regions tend to be a little lean. And it's, it's one of the things that we think with that uh, extended hang time, we're able to round out that mouthfeel and really give it some weightiness. So very, uh, very mineral driven. Um, fruit forward as well, but uh, definitely the weightiness of this um, is something that we really are after uh, every single vintage is trying to get that weightiness. And um, I think this is a good expression of that. It did, uh, did get 92 points in the wine enthusiast and editor's choice. Um, so any questions, uh, I would welcome them. Would you, say, would you say that's a very um, distinct signature style of reason that you have over at Wagner when maybe, or, or 
it seems like a lot of producers in the Finger Lakes like to go more for like that leaner, high acid kind of, um, you know, style. Yeah, I, I definitely think that uh, the, I've, I've had a few where uh, a little higher acid and maybe not that, that mouthfeel and that weightiness to it. And I think by getting super ripe fruit, um, which, which is always our goal, um, we can bring the acidity down a little bit, still have a, a, a wine that's super dry, this four grams per liter, and it, it, it's got a little bit more weight to it. Um, sure. I think awesome uh, food pairings, anything, seafood, fish, chicken, uh, lighter salads. Uh, we, uh, we drink a lot of this, my wife and I, it's, it's an awesome dinner wine. I've had some wonderful sweet and sour dishes with it, some curry-based dishes, you know, especially with Finger Lakes Riesling that just make for really perfect pairings um, that I like. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I think uh, that was a really good kind of back-to-back, -back, you know, one with Cuca Lake followed by uh, Seneca. John, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, your wines are absolutely delightful, and I look forward to seeing you soon when I go back up there. Um, we're going to head down south and go east um, over to the North Fork on Long Island. And we're gonna go with really a wonderful human being, good friend, Kareem Masood from uh, Pominog Vineyards. He's gonna be talking about his 2019 Sauvignon Blanc, but really one of the first properties to be out in the North Fork. They're doing some tremendous work out there. And, uh, you know, he talk about diversity. Um, his parents have this incredible story and I'll let Kareem introduce himself and his family background. Welcome Kareem. Thank you, Yana. Great to be with you and, and my colleagues from around the, the state. Um, this is great to, to be a part of this. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, my, mo my mother was born and raised in the Pfalz in Germany, and my father was born and raised in, in Lebanon. And, and I'm a mixed up kid. My brothers and I are all mixed up kids. That's our, our dry joke. And my parents met in the obvious place in Philadelphia uh, as students. Uh, but so, but my mother really does have uh, wine growing in her blood. Uh, we still have relatives to this day who are vintners in the Pfalz. And, uh, my, and while they do grow really beautiful wines in Lebanon, my, my father's family were, were, not, were not vintners, but they were wine, uh, wine lovers. And so uh, when my parents met, it wasn't long before they realized that they had this common uh, love for wine, and they became more and more interested in becoming wine lovers themselves. And, uh, and uh, so my father started a career with IBM in the Middle East um, with, his, with his background, uh, his heritage being from the Middle East. They off I IBM offered him an opportunity to start in the Middle East. And so what does that have to do with wine? Uh, the, he, he, as my father put it, he uh, couldn't buy wine, so he had to make wine out of necessity in Kuwait. Kuwait is literally, literally and figuratively, a dry country. It's a desert, and uh, and uh, and it's and there's no legal market for alcohol. So as he put it, he had to make wine. That was his first time making wine. I was as a home winemaker back in uh, in Kuwait when he was in his twenties. Anyway, fast forward a few years, we moved to the States. Uh, my parents settled in Connecticut. And this was the late 70s. And my parents read an article about Alex and Louisa Hargrave, who were the, the pioneers on Long Island. And uh, they came out uh, and met them in 78. And by 1983, my parents closed on what is today Pamanak Vineyards. And so by the way, we're absolutely a, a family business. Um, uh, my brother Nabil is our vineyard manager. My brother Salim is our office manager. Uh, my parents are still alive and well and, and involved, not quite as much as they once were, but they're, they're beginning to sort of semi-retire, but they're still very much involved. And the third generation is, uh, is growing up. I, I have two children. My, my, my brothers have children as well. So there's, there's seven members of the third generation. And that is, in fact, our aspiration is to be a multi-generational uh, family wine estate. And that, that is, you know, what, what we've been working on now for, for 37 years. Uh, my parents started in 1983, planting our first vines, um, Riesling and Chardonnay in 1983. And so, uh, so but what I was going to, the point I was going to make that were uh, you, the obvious thing would be, you know, 
if you're a family winery, we should be named Masood Family Vineyards. That's, that's our family name. But in fact, you won't see our family name anywhere on the bottle. Uh, and uh, we went with the name Pamanak. Uh, and so at, at first I thought Pamanak was kind of an odd name to name a winery because what does that mean? And how do you say it? And it's just not, not a great brand name. And, uh, but now that we've been making wine, uh, growing wine for 37 years, it's actually the perfect name because wine is all about place and provenance, the origin of where the fruit comes from is all important uh, in wine as, as we know. And so what better name than the old native name for this place where we grow our grapes and um, the famous American poet, Walt Whitman, who was a native of Long Island, uh, he would refer to Long Island as my beloved Pamanak. And in fact, we have an excerpt from one of his poems on, on many of our, our labels. And by the way, it was, Walt, it was Walt's 200th birthday last summer. We supplied some wine for his birthday party. Very cool. um, but yeah, so we're, we're definitely, uh, that, that is very much a part of our story is, is, is our, uh, the family aspect and the old world heritage. So, um, you know, I'm half German and, and I learned winemaking from my father, both of which yield a sort of clean, technically correct winemaking style that, that I learned from my father and the German influence also uh, supports clean, technically correct uh, style of winemaking. And um, and I think and that's what we have tonight. I think in the Sauvignon Blanc. I think you could you can say that about this wine, um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but I guess I should speak a little bit about our, our terroir and. Um, yeah, if you can get into a little bit about what makes the North Fork unique, um, and also talk up if you don't mind a little bit about. I mean, one thing, um, Pomeranc is synonymous for their Chenin Blanc, and also yeah. your your minimalist. Uh, uh, lineup that you do have that's fantastic. Great, yeah. Yeah, so the Chenin Blanc uh, is another sort of great story where, where it wasn't in our original game, game plan to grow Chenin Blanc. It was one of these happy accidents in wine where uh, uh, my parents acquired the vineyard across the street in, in, the, in the 80s, shortly after they started themselves. And the, the, the grower who had planted Shannon, as far as we know, had no real aspiration to make a quality wine. Our understanding was that he planted it to, to reduce his cost of making Chardonnay because, because Shannon Blanc yielded better than Chardonnay and he wanted to, he was gonna blend it with the Shannon and, and, and reduced his cost of production. Little did he know and little did, did we know that years later, my father would start bottling it and uh, it turned into this really uh, special and unique wine um, and for so many reasons, uh, well, it was unique because it was the only one for, for quite a long time being grown in not just Long Island, but the whole state of New York, as far as I know. And, uh, and special because uh, it just, it's just this uh, sort of, similar to the Sauvignon Blanc we're going to taste tonight. They both marry really, really well with the seafood that we're so, that surrounds us on Long Island, especially shellfish, oysters and clams and scallops. Um, uh, just really, really marries very well with uh, all of the bounty uh, that we get from the sea. Uh, and the, min the minimalist uh, range that we produce that Yannick that you're referring to, that's, that's, uh, was kind of a, um, my little baby that I, that I uh, have been pushing for a few years now, where as the name implies, we made, we make these wines in, and, and I mean, many of our wines are made in a, in a, in a sort of in a minimalist way, but th this range is especially so where we absolutely nothing is done or added to the minimalist wines other than a tiny touch of sulfites before bottling and that's it. Uh, they, 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 they get filtered and that's the only thing that happens to them. There are no other additions. So the idea is to make a so-called vende terroir where the wine is as so expressive as possible of the place where it's grown without any other inputs which is actually not what we're having tonight. Tonight we're having, and so that will beg the question, well, like, well, how does it differ from the other wines you do? So for example, the wine we're gonna taste tonight, we, we did inoculate, I, I added yeast, and that's one big difference with the minimalist wines. We don't inoculate, we don't add anything. And, um, and I can get, get more and more into the technical aspects of the winemaking, but, uh, but I should just mention, I mean, of course, Long Island is an island. It's surrounded by water, and that's that's very very important. We have a maritime climate. 
We're surrounded by the Atlantic, the Conic Bay, Long Island Sound, and on the, especially on the north, uh, well, actually both forks are, 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 are both uh, peninsulas jutting out into the water. And, and so that's uh, buffering, you know, the moderating the temperatures in the winter. Um, and uh, the, these bodies of water, especially the Atlantic, acts as, a, uh, as an air conditioner wait well into the summer. And then by the end of the summer, the water is warmed up and now it's a heat sink and it, we have it really acts as a season extender, uh, giving us really quite a long growing season and the ability to grow really a whole, um, you know, roster of different varieties. We're up to 12 varieties now at Pamanac. Oh, we, wow. planted, we planted four new ones in the last three years, including Melon de Bourgogne. Uh, yes. So we now grow four Loire varieties at Pamanac, the, the one that was, you know, the fun one that we talked about was the Shannon that, that, you know, for a long time we were the only ones doing it. And now we have Shannon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, Melon de Bourgogne and, and Cabernet Franc, which are all grown in the Loire. And, um, and then of course the Bordeaux varieties where if you were to, to, to make comparisons, Bordeaux has so many parallels with Long Island or vice versa with, with the maritime climate, the topogra topography is quite flat in contrast to places like the Finger Lakes where you do get those slopes. We don't have much of that on Long Island. But the reason we get away with being on flat land is because the soils really drain incredibly well. We have a sandy loam with sandy gravelly subsoils and it's really hard to beat that for, for drainage. Um, but I should probably go on to the wine because I could talk, I could talk for like another hour about, about all kinds of things. Oh, that's great. I mean, this is what they're all here for. Let, can I, can I, uh, thank you. Okay, thanks for putting that up. And uh, I also have a couple of visual, a couple of slides I'll show in a sec, but here I'm gonna pop open my bottle, which looks like the bottle on your screen. Um, but so the, uh, the 19 Sauvignon Blanc, um, it's, um, uh, fermented in stainless steel tanks, uh, totally dry, and just this appetite wetting, um, you know, uh, wine that makes you want to take another sip. And like I said earlier, just marries perfectly well with something like striped bass from, you know, uh, from the Atlantic uh, or oysters that were, um, that, you know, we get at our, our fish markets near us. And I also, I don't know if you saw me open the bottle. We're huge fans of screw caps at Pamanoff. And um, yeah, that's a whole nother chapter of-, of uh, Well, it really is eating. a family affair. I mean, I went there last year. I've been there uh, more than a couple of times. And last year I went there and your, you guys were super busy. Your brother was in the parking lot directing the cars. You were running around clearing the tables and serving oysters. And your mom was also doing like, I think behind the register. So. It is truly a, a, a charming family and the work that you guys are doing is A plus. I absolutely love the wines that you produce. And not only that, but you guys are just the nicest human beings. Thank you, thank you, Yannick. Uh, can I share like, uh, is this working? Is my screen um, um, trying to share my screen? Is this working? I, you, yep, yeah, there you go. We got it. So th this is just a couple of quick visuals of, of, of Pamanak. Uh, throughout the year. Uh, we're 100% solar powered, by the way. And we're also part of Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing, the first organization of its kind on the East Coast that, uh, as the name implies, uh, sort of, uh, uh, we're, we have someone who actually inspects us and verifies that we do what we say we're doing with regard to sustainability, hence the term uh, certified sustainable. That's our seller right there. And here's some shots of what's coming up in the winter. Um, <laughs> um, let's see, how do I get back out of here? Okay. Well, Karima, thank you for the presentation. Uh, your wine. Cheers, is, thank you. Um, next up is uh, Matthew Spaccarelli from uh, Fjord 2019. Albarino, we're going to talk a little bit about Albarino, one of my favorite grapes, originally from Ria Spaisas in Spain. But we're going to be talking about the Hudson Valley. And just again, talking about generosity and humility and being down to earth, I visited um, Matt a couple of weeks ago and he was on vacation in Montauk and I sent him an email and I said, hey, can I come by to your winery? Can I come say hello? And he said, well, I'm in Montauk, but you know what? I'm going to cut my trip short and I'll come down. And so it was very generous of him. I didn't want to do that. I felt bad, but he spent a good amount of time with me 
Um, and it was really a true pleasure to taste his lineup of wines. It does such a great job. And he's the perfect guy to talk about the Hudson Valley. So it's great to have you on that. Thanks for having me. Um, it was also going to rain on our vacation. So it, <laughs> can uh, you talk to uh, talk to us about Fjord? It's a it, a fairly new project. Uh, it started in 2013. Um, and also, I know you have a big connection to the Hudson Valley. So if you can talk about that as well. So yeah, um, Fjord Vineyard is kind of an offshoot uh, from my family winery, Ben Marl. Um, Unlike the first two speakers, we're first generation uh, grape growers. Uh, and, you know, the, the Hudson Valley has pretty deep history. I got a little slideshow to share with the that portion of it. Um, but my family's only been in the wine business since 06. Um, and we purchased Ben Marl from the Miller family. And kind of at that time, Ben Marl was producing a lot of out-of-state wines and things like that. So <clears throat> we kind of transitioned to um, operating as a farm winery again. Um, and in that time, uh, I started managing little small one acre, two acre blocks uh, throughout the Hudson Valley. And uh, my partner, Casey, and I were like, let's start our own label. This, uh, this will be fun. Um, and it kind of gives us a little bit of flexibility. And we don't have to be dogmatic about anything. And um, you know, we're probably maxing out at 2,000 cases a year on a good year. So um, it's just a fun little side project. And the Albarino is, is you know, one of those varieties that you know, we could just plant without uh, having a a market plan for it. And it's just like, hey, let's see how it grows and uh, play around with it. And um, if it does well, well, we'll expand from there. Hey, Matt, sorry to cut you off. Can you talk a little, little bit about Fjord, what, what that means, the etymology of that word and how it applies to, to, the, to, the, to the valley itself? Yep. So like the other regions in New York, um, um, you know, it's, it's the bodies of water uh, that allow us to grow varieties that we wouldn't be able to grow elsewhere. Um, the difference here in the Hudson Valley is it's not necessarily the water itself, like on the Sound or up in the Finger Lakes, but it's the actual shape of the valley um, that acts as a conduit of warm air coming up from the Atlantic. Um, and if I could figure out how to advance these photos, there we go. Um, I'm gonna go forward a little more. Here we go. So, um, actually, can we go one more? There we go. So this is just a map of a USDA cold hardiness. And on the bottom of your screen where New York is, you can see there's kind of a, um, a cone shape effect going up through Rockland, Westchester County, then Orange and Putnam. Um, and that's basically the, um, the effect that the valley's having on bringing warmer air up. Um, so the Hudson, base of the Hudson River is an estuary, so it's flowing both ways. And in that estuary, there's a really old fjord. Um, I'm a Hudson Valley native, so it's these mountains that we would hike as kids. And, um, it's like, oh, that's kind of a cool geological, you know, um, identifier for, for our region and also a little bit of what, you know, makes us able to grow certain varieties here, like Albarino and Cap Franc, Chardonnay. Yep. So, um, if I could go back a little bit. I'm sorry, this technology thing is not my... Here we go. I'm gonna share my screen. So a little bit about the history of the Hudson Valley, um, being that where it is so close to New York City. Um, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, grape growing region um, where the French Huguenots settled in. New Paltz, 1677, started growing vineyards there. Um, and then during the late 1800s, um, there was a, a big push between some growers here in, um, in the Hudson Valley to, I'm sorry, I'm losing everybody here. Am I still on there? No, you, you don't have the, oh, there, no, I, there you go, we got it. 
We have the history of Great Brook and the Hudson Valley being presented right now. Okay. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of uh, grape hybridization going on in the Hudson Valley. Um, so Andrew Jackson Kaywood, I think it was 1840s, 1860s, um, planted the property here in Marlboro that we grow grapes on now. Um, and then the Hudson Valley is also home to um, the Jacques family winery, which is now known as Brotherhood, and it's the oldest continuously producing winery in the United States. Um, so if we move forward. Yep. All right. So 1950s, 60s is when Ben Marl was purchased by the Miller family, Mark Miller, um, from the Kaywood family. And he re the property, replanted it with some vinifera and hybrid varieties. Uh, vinifera proved to fail pretty quick. Um, so most of the vinifera was ripped out and hybrids were planted. Um, we have 67, um, 1960, is it 67? Yep. Is the, I think it was 76, was the Farm Winery Act was, um, was passed by Governor, Governor Carey and um, Ben Marl had farm winery license number one. Uh, Mark Miller, John Dyson from Millbrook Vineyards and a bunch of other growers here in New York. Um, and the passing of that bill was really instrumental in the expansion of um, winemaking in New York. It allowed smaller producers to get into the game. So, um, so, one regional difference that we have here in the Hudson Valley is extreme variability. Um, I, I brought up these topo maps of um, Marlboro here, which is the town that we grow in. Um, and to the right, you see uh, the east side of Seneca Lake. Um, because of the kind of glacial carving that happened here, there's more pockets and divots and um, it kind of makes growing grapes on a really large scale, a little bit different um, because the soils change so fast, uh, the terrain, the aspect, the slope. Um, so one thing that we found really kind of nice in, in our production is that, you know, we, we have these cool little one, two acre spots here, three acres there, four acres here, um, that we're growing almost the same, sometimes the same clones, um, same rootstocks, but getting very different wines. Um, so uh, it'll be fun to kind of expand that as time goes on. Uh, Plenty more vineyards and, and all these cool Hudson little- Valley, It's fair to say that it's sort of like a, a patchwork of different soils, a patchwork of different microclimates, right? Yeah, very much so. Um, I always get the question of like, oh, what kind of soil do you have here? And it's like, well, what part of the row are you talking about? You know, is right. it at the top of the hill or the bottom of the hill? Uh, right. things, things change so quickly. Um, which is a challenge, but it also, you know, opens up opportunities uh, as well, so. But you've got to be... Say that again? I think your screen froze. Quite calculate on how, on, can you hear me? Now I can, yep. I, I was going to ask, you have to be very calculating based on what grape you're going to plant, based on your uh, diversity of uh, soils that you have out there, right? Um, yeah, very much so. Um, so. So something like Albarino grown in the Hudson Valley, can you talk to us about that? And, and what, what, you know, why are you so enthusiastic about this Albarino in particular? I mean, it's, it's absolutely delicious. And I, I'm sure most people would wonder, how is it even possible that you can grow Albarino up in the Hudson Valley? So, you know, I, I don't want to say it was a, a, a variety that we were like, hey, this is something that we can grow. This is something that, that we know is going to do here, uh, do well here. It's more of a, we took a chance on it. Um, and it is, it, it, it is quite sensitive. It's more sensitive than Riesling and Cab Franc. Um, but it is something that, uh, I don't know. It's just a fun, fun project for us. Uh, and I guess that's what's fun about, you know, the Fjord Vineyards label is that we get to play around with this stuff all the time. And 
you know, take a chance on it because it's not not a full time job for us. Where with Ben Marl, that's our real production facility where we're making you know eight nine thousand cases a year. Uh, what's the uh, philosophical approach that you take with the uh, Fjord? I mean, you know, when I tasted your wines and from what I know of them, it seems like you have a real kind of minimalist approach, kind of hands off and let the terroir speak. And, and a, a lot of the work happens in the vineyard. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I get to spend most of my time in the vineyards in the summer. Um, you know, I, I, I do work as the, the winemaker, but I prefer to be in the vineyards. Um, and, you know, our approach to making wines is just trying not to be dogmatic about it. And, um, you know, certain years we're given skin contact, other years we're not. Um, and, you know, that goes kind of across the board, whether it's Cab Francs or uh, our rosés, Chardonnays, um, you know, we get to play around with everything all the time. So um, I guess that's the one thing that would be, I would say is like, our philosophy is there's not a huge philosophy besides trying to make really cool, tasty, fun wines. Um, how would, uh, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the profile of Albarino and what went behind it as far as taste and, and how you made it and what you were trying to uh, uh, achieve? So Albarino tends to be a pretty phenolic variety. Um, and the way I look at it is why well, try to avoid it when you can embrace it. So um, each year, depending on the ripeness of the fruit, um, it gets between a three and six hour cold soak before we press it off, um, just to pull a little bit more of that um, from the skins. This vineyard is, um, it's a very low producing vineyard. We're getting one and a half to three tons to the acre. Um, three tons is when we started to put a double fruiting wire, uh, just because the yields were so low. But it's just not the vineyard, um, you know, the clusters themselves are extremely small and the skins are extremely thick. So when we're pressing off, we're getting extremely low yields. Um, probably like 135 gallons per ton. Um, and there's a huge amount of solids uh, compared to any other wine that we're making. So um, from there, we're racking off like 15% of solids sometimes. Um, so I found that the cold soap kind of helps everything settle out a little bit more. And, um, and from, from there, it's just really cool. We do inoculate this wine. We don't inoculate all of them. Um, but I do find that, you know, when we're going for that aromatic purity um, with, with the Albarino, inoculating really helps. Um, and just a cool, long fermentation. Try to keep it clean. And uh, we typically won't rack it if there's not a problem with the fermentation. So it sits on fermentation leaves. We don't stir them. Um, there's, you know, no batonage or anything. Uh, and bottle it and young with a lot of CO2. Uh, similar to Kareem, uh, we yep. use screw caps on all of our production. Um, <laughs> I'd tell you more about it, but Kareem would probably correct me and uh, have, have more to say. <laughs> um, but I do find in, in, in our, our climate, screw caps tend to just keep the wines a little bit better. Um, so well, I think, I, I think you're doing a spectacular job. Um, you know, what's happening in the Hudson Valley is extremely exciting. And uh, people should definitely check out your wines and definitely uh, take a visit up to the Hudson Valley, especially this time of year. It's got to be gorgeous right now. Yeah, we're, we're probably about 30, 40% through um, the leaves changing. Uh, and this year's turning out to be super pretty. Uh, last year was a little blase, but um, yeah, the Valley is such a great place too, because uh, we have a great food scene. We have the wine, um, sorry, the wine, the Culinary Institute of America up in Hyde Park. Um, and there's just a lot to do from hiking, the food scene. Um, hopefully that all bounces back after, after sure. and all that. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful place and it's proximity to the city is just, Great, uh, 89 minutes from Grand Central. It's exactly. kind of hard to beat. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. And um, perhaps we'll have some questions um, later on, but we're gonna head up um, just north of uh, Buffalo to the Niagara Escarpment, a region that I have not been to, that I need to go to. Um, some exciting stuff happening up there, happening up there as well. Um, so much to talk about. 
Um, we have Robin Ross, who is going to talk about Arrowhead Spring, and they're going to be featuring their 2017 Cabernet Franc. Um, this is a, a, a winery that focuses on sustainability as far as uh, farming goes and also winemaking. And we'd love to hear more about that and a little bit about the history of your winery, but also what's happening in the Niagara Escarpment. Yep. Welcome, Robin. Thank you, Yannick. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, Jen, if you just put my uh, slides up, I think I'm going to start with some pictures because it's a little bit easier to talk with some visuals here. So um, the view that you're seeing on the screen right now is a lot like things look actually earlier today. Um, the shot wasn't from earlier today, but we're in a beautiful fall color right now. And in the building in the lower portion of the screen, um, that would be our winery making facility, our winemaking facility, and also our tasting and visitor center. We, for years, we were up on the hillside, up in the gray building. We live up there on one side, and the, and the leftmost portion was our initial uh, winery. And it was quite small. It was a bit of an experiment for us to see if we could not only um, grow grapes in a sustainable manner, but also um, actually have a building that would not be too much of a drain on energy and natural resources. So it was built into the hillside. And we learned from that with the ambient earth temperature here of around 55 degrees Fahrenheit, we really didn't have to heat or cool the cellars. Um, that space was only a thousand square feet of production space and a thousand square feet of tasting. And uh, it housed us for quite a while, but then in 2016, we built a new facility and we were finally able to do um, harvest and production there. And finally in 2019, we opened the retail space as well. That facility is built into a hillside a little bit closer to the road. Um, it's 14,000 square feet. The cellars itself, the, the barrel room uh, is 13 and a half feet tall. So we have a lot more space to stack barrels on top of each other. And then with the earth wrapping around the entire cellars, we don't really have to heat or cool the lower um, levels of the building. The top portion where we have retail is, has a geothermal uh, heating and cooling system. And we also generate wind power on our site with a wind turbine. And this year we've added solar as well. So we're kind of, we're trying to get this idea of being as careful about our environmental usage here in our building as we are hopefully in our vineyards. Uh, you can see on the screen too, the vineyard stretching um, north to south. Uh, I grew up in a farming family. Um, and like many kids and farmers, I swear I'd never farm again. So um, I spent the early part of my adulthood as a software engineer, actually. My background's in math and computer science, and I wasn't really into wine um, and didn't really drink much until I met my husband. But this was really his idea. His dream was to have a winery, and he'd always um, thought that that would be something we should pursue when we retired. And knowing how long it takes vines to actually produce fruit and have something usable, um, I suggested that we just go ahead and do it at that time. Uh, so in 2004, we purchased land in the Niagara Scarpen area. We were pretty sure we could have a successful wine growing operation here because just across the border in Canada um, is Niagara on the Lake and they have, there's hundreds of fantastic wineries there, a uh, wine growing region that's a lot more developed than our side of the border. So we knew that it was a possibility from climate. Um, we knew we were the second, second warmest growing region in New York State after Long Island. Um, but we it was also a bit of a risk because our area is not really well known yet. So in a way it was, it's been fun to kind of be a pioneer in an area where wine's just starting to take off again. Um, so then also I wanted to talk a little bit, um, if we go forward, I guess, to the next slide, um, about our, ourselves and uh, the background of the farm. I mentioned there's a good shot of Duncan and I and the dog and enjoying the vineyard on a nice day. Um, we are located in the Niagara Escarpment AVA. That, the Niagara Escarpment itself, if you think of Niagara Falls, of course, greatest wonder of the world, that sits in the Niagara Escarpment. Um, the falls sits back from us quite a bit because of erosion, but that same long cliff, that same escarpment feature, uh, geologically extends all the way to Wisconsin and quite a ways into New York State. So it's a very long escarpment. Our AVA is just a tiny portion of it here in the Niagara region, a certain 
distance from Lake Ontario and a certain um, amount of slope to the land. So it's a, it's a really small AVA, um, but it's got some nice, um, nice features to it, I guess. It's a, it's a good place to, to grow. It's um, a, warmer, a warmer area that allows us to grow things is, is winter tender is um, Merlot. We have approximately 30,000 vines planted now, um, all vinifera. We're trying to be sustainable in the vineyard as well as in the wine cellars themselves. We, we don't use herbicide, for example, on the farm, so our vineyards might look a little messier than um, some people have been accustomed to seeing in the past, but we really believe that that's good for the soil health in the area. And it's also um, just a nice, a nice, play, a nice thing to do to be able to walk through a vineyard and see wildflowers and, and hear insects buzzing and hopefully not, not on the clusters. Hey, Robin, sorry to cut you off. Can you talk a little bit about, you, you had mentioned uh, an important point that uh, the Niagara, Niagara Escarpment is the second warmest region in uh, the state of New York. Um, you know, most people who are probably, you know, on this webinar are wondering how is that even possible? You guys are all the way up north, um, you know, brutal winters. Can you talk a little bit about the important factors and, and some of the soils that you have out there? Sure. So Lake Ontario is just to the north of us. It's probably from my location here, maybe 10 miles north. And it's, it's big, right? It's, it's 800 feet deep. It's about 30 miles across at the point that we are. And it, it doesn't freeze. So it's a big heat sink. And one of the things that that allows us to do is to have a very extended autumn season. So for example, we're usually still full leaf in the vineyard into the first weeks of November. We don't drop leaf and that gives us extended maturation on the fruits. Um, as far as the temperatures and the coldness, I know Buffalo has gotten quite a reputation because we had a blizzard back in 1977 and it was a bit of a cold year. Um, and we do get snow here. And in fact, I think that sometimes protects us. Everybody remembers the winter of 2015 where we were in single digits across New York State. Actually, our area in the Niagara Scarabin, the whole month of February, we never got above five degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and the nighttime temperatures dropped. Um, I believe the lowest temperature I recorded here was minus nine Fahrenheit. And I had heard for years that Merlot wouldn't survive in these temperatures. So I was expecting to go into spring with a dead vineyard, but actually we only lost a couple vines um, due to the cold. And I believe it was the combination of the snowpack that we had in the vineyard, great snowshoeing winter. And then also um, in other years when we haven't had snow, we've been lucky in having that moderating effect off Lake Ontario with the, with the cold air coming over top the escarpment, but hitting that warm air mass and just we're, you know, it's protecting us. We're coming off the lake. We're keeping a warmer temperature here. And um, what what grapes are you? Uh, I mean, obviously, we're going to taste the Cab Franc. But what other grapes are you growing currently um, at your winery? So we're growing um, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, um, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Uh, some we've just planted some Vignet this year, so I'm hoping that that'll do well. Um, in the past, we've tried Malbec. Um, it wasn't a question of temperature for us with the Malbec. It wasn't successfully successful here, I think, because our site's a little bit too windy for it. It's got more of a dishy kind of a leaf on it, and I had it on the westmost portion of the vineyard, and it uh, didn't really do well, so we pulled it out. Um, we've tried Tempranillo. Again, I don't think we're dry enough for that grape that's coming out, too, but the other varieties are doing quite well. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, 2017 Cap Bronc that we're trying this evening? Sure. So this Cabernet Franc, we harvested on um, October 22nd of 2017. And when the grapes came in at harvest, they were around 23 bricks of sugar. And that's pretty common. You usually can get the Cab Franc um, usually up to 23, 24 bricks. And that's about it for ripening uh, for us for that particular variety. It's one of the last things we bring in. October 22nd actually was a little bit early of a harvest for us. We brought this in as late as November 3rd or 4th before. Um, we grow three different clones of Cabernet Franc, clone 327, 214, and clone 623. And the combination of these three really gives some nice, deep, rich color in the wine. This wine, we brought it in and fermented it mostly in small lots, uh, mostly in one ton fermenter bins. And then um, a certain portion of the Cabernet Franc was done in a huge fermenter. And I will point out, we don't use all of it for the just a straight varietal. It's in several of our blends that we have as well. 
So we, we're only seeing only 168 cases, uh, I believe, of this particular bottling were set aside. Um, alcohol on this line is 13%. So uh, you may note that 24 to 23 bricks, you're not going to get 13%. We did capitalize up to 25 uh, bricks of sugar on this. And then after fermentation, and we try to do like a, a hot fermentation, when the grapes are coming in this late, they're coming in quite cool. So we, we leave them in the, in the bins until they heat up a bit and with daily hand punch downs two to three times a day. And then um, after the skins have broken down quite a bit, we press out the juice and the free run goes into a certain allotment of barrels and the press run goes into another allotment of barrels. And then there they sit for two years, basically. Um, of course, we pay attention to them, top them off, et cetera. And then after about a two year period, we do an assemblage meeting where we gather up staff, our head of sales, um, Duncan is head of the winery, of the winemaking portion, our assistant winemaker and vineyard manager. And we all taste through every single barrel in the allotment to decide where the, um, where the wine's gonna end up. So for the Cab Franc that we're trying tonight, we're hoping that this is like a, well, it is a great example of what we do with Cab Franc here. We, you notice it has some nice deep rich color and quite a bit of a berry scent to it. And uh, it'll, it'll age quite well. There's nice acidity in there as well. Is this a, a style that one should expect when they find a Cab Franc from the Niagara Escarpment? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, Robin, thank you so much. And uh, I've got to make it out there one of these days. And uh, it, it's exciting to see what's happening at the Niagara Escarpment. And uh, you're definitely doing a great job in putting it on the map. So thank you. Thanks, and hope to see you here too, Yannick. For sure. We're going to head into the South Fork in the Hampton specifically. At Wolfer Estate, we're going to be trying their 2017 Fatalis Fatum. Um, Roman Roth was supposed to be with us, but he's busy, you know, picking grapes and making wine. It's just that crazy time of year. So we're also thank you, thankful for all the other winemakers and everyone that's making time for us today. Um, we're with Mindy Crawford, so welcome. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit about Wolfer Estate. You know how it was founded in 1988 by Christian Wolfer and all the great work that you're doing. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me, uh, Yannick, and uh, it's great to be here with everybody. Uh, yeah, Roman is so sorry he couldn't make it. He is just literally knee deep in, um, in grapes, and it's a crazy time, but it's a wonderful time. So um, basically, to give you a little history of our winery, we uh, were started in 1988. Christian Wolfer was a venture capitalist from Hamburg, Germany, and he moved to the Hamptons in the 70s. And um, in 1988, he decided, he's like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow some grapes. I'm going to plant some grapes. Everybody's like, you are crazy. It's not going to work. You don't say that. You never said that to Christian. Um, Christian always was, he was stubborn and thank God he was. And he planted um, some fabulous grapes. So basically we have a property. It's 175 acres. 55 of that is the vineyard. Um, and on that property, we have Merlot, we have Cabernet Franc, we have Pinot Noir, we have Trebbiano, um, we have a little bit of Vignole, which is a hybrid grape we use for acidity in our dessert wine, and um, we have Chardonnay. So uh, we're on the South Fork, whereas Kareem is on the North Fork, he's on the other fork. Uh, we have you know similar growing region, slightly different. We're about 2.6 miles from um, from the ocean. So we get the ocean sea breezes. We have the similar growing region to Bordeaux. And that's kind of why it's a fun uh, wine that we decided to uh, taste tonight because we have a Bordeaux style blend. Um, we are a certified sustainable vineyard. Um, the primary soil that we've got is uh, we have a Bridgehampton loam, which is wonderful. It goes about six feet deep and uh, then drains into sand, which really makes it conducive for growing. And uh, it's uh, really, uh, really terrific. So um, now Christian Wolfer passed in 2008, tragically, um, but we were very fortunate that two out of four of his children, Joey and Mark, decided to take over the winery. And so we are a family owned winery. Um, we have been uh, very fortunate in that sense. And there's a great involvement from the family. Joey's husband, Max, is our general manager. So everybody is really hands-on. Um, Roman became, you know, part of, you know, he became a partner. He's been here 
since the second vintage that we had. 1992 was our first vintage and our second vintage was 1993 and that was when Roman started. So uh, Roman has been around for a while as he's saying it's every year he gets a little bit blonder if you know <laughs> Roman. Mindy, um, what was it about that particular site and was there, was there, was there uh, another farm there before um, the, uh, Christian purchased it? Yes. Well, he actually started with the uh, horse farm because we have horse farm on the property, 100 yeah. acres, but we were on a lot of old potato farms. Um, yeah. This whole South Fork was very much a potato farm area. And um, so, yeah, then that's, he was really wanted to do the wines. Quite interesting. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, this wine that we're going to try tonight? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's actually one of my, it's one of my favorites. So it's the Fatalis Fatum. And just to give you an idea on this wine as well, this is part of our White Horse series of wines. And uh, Christian always wanted to integrate the wine and the horses that he had. Because our stables, we have an 80, per, um, 80 horse stable on the property. Joey, it, she is a, a huge equestrian and um, very involved in that as well. So it's really near and dear to the family's heart. So Fatalis Fatum was actually one of the horses that was uh, Christian had purchased right before his death. Uh, and since then they had to sell Fatalis, but Fatalis went on to the world games. So um, really neat. The horse was a very uh, stubborn horse, but a very, uh, very talented horse, um, hunter and jumper. So this wine in particular is a Bordeaux style blend. As you can see, it's uh, Merlot, Cab Franc, Cab Sauvignon, and a little bit of Petit Verdot, uh, traditional Bordeaux grapes. Uh, it sees about 20 months in oak. Roman uh, uses pretty much all French oak, um, and it's a combination of new one, two, and three-year oak. And um, he uses very little botanage, so it's more in the traditional style, so he doesn't do a lot of oxygenation, and uh, which gives it a lot more ageability potential. Um, it's, as I said, it's one of my favorite wines, and I'm gonna take a sip of it as we're having it. And, um, it's just, uh, it's so wonderful to pair. I would pair this with short ribs. I would pair this with venison, just a steak on the grill, a nice rich pasta. It's yeah. so complimentary. Mindy, um, as far as the South, as far as the South, South Fork goes, how many other wineries are there? I think I know there's yourself and there's Candy Daughters. And is there a third? Is it Duck Walk? Or is yeah, that just- Duck Walk is down there as well, but it seems Duck Walk's more primary. Uh, location is up on the North Fork as well. So they've got South Fork property and North Fork property. And it's kind of neat because all three of us really have our own unique niche and yep. have our own styles, which um, we all kind of complement each other in that respect, which is a good thing. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, you guys do a great job. You also have, you know, you have your signature, uh, Cider rosé, I guess, right? Which yes, is we have our ciders that we're doing that actually are coming from upstate. Uh, we actually, I take that back, we use some of uh, the Halsey Farm apples for uh, the white cider because we like to be, you know, as local as possible. They just can't provide us with all the apples, so we do go upstate for the rosé cider apples. Um, we have, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we do produce a lot of rosé, as Roman says, everything he seems to touch turns pink. And... <laughs> <laughs> all, my, all my little Romanisms that I, I say, um, for anybody that knows Roman, he is quite the character. And, uh, but it's true. And so, uh, but we do all the rosé, which affords him the opportunity to make some uh, really fabulous reds to go along with it. Well, you guys have a beautiful property. If uh, people who, who are here, still here listening and watching, I'm sorry that it's gone overtime, beyond oh, overtime. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no, it's not your fault. Not, a, not at all. No, no, no. It's all me, you know. But, um, but it's a beautiful property. People should definitely check it out. It's worth the trip. Um, in all of these wonderful regions um, that we have here in the state of New York, please do check them out. Um, again, I can't tell you how incredibly kind all of these individuals are and other farmers here in the state of New York. Go support them. Go show them love because they will show it back to you. I don't know if we have any time for any Q and A, um, but I really want to thank everybody for making time in their busy schedules, spending time 
and spreading the, the gospel of New York State wines. I want to also thank the New York Wine and Grape Foundation for um, organizing this and for all the hard work that you guys are doing. So thank you very, very much. Thank Cheers. Cheers, and thank you, Yannick, for a wonderful uh, presentation and, and your support. Oh, no, please. It's, it's, you guys are doing a great job. And um, I hope you all end up with a very strong vintage and um, happy harvest. Thank you. I'll, thank you. I'll drink to that. Cheers. I agree. Cheers, everyone. Drink New York. Drink thank New you, York. Yannick. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Kareem, see you later, guys. Bye, Bye now. Bye.